Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on ALTA surveys. It's not just an ALTA, the key challenges of the ALTA NSPS land title survey process. A little background for you today, the land title surveys are so much more than just a boundary and topo survey, understanding the client, lender, and title company needs while also meeting the minimum requirements are critical for a successful project. The QK team will help you understand how to navigate some of these challenges, learn what to watch for, and help you have a better understanding of what differentiates a land title survey from other survey work. This presentation is going to be given today by three surveyors from QK. The first, Michael Knopf, professional engineer and professional land surveyor, Brandon Walker, professional land surveyor, and myself, Antonio Westerlin, professional land surveyor and certified federal surveyor. First, presenting is going to be Mike Knopf, who is a professional engineer, but was a land surveyor first. He's been licensed for over 40 years, holds land survey and engineering certificates in California, Nevada, and Arizona, as well as having a remote license for aerial surveying. He's a former CEO of Quadnoff, DBA QK, and he's going to be discussing with us our first concept, who is the client anyway? Okay, well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. Um, basically, the, the ALTA and SPS land title survey is all about title insurance. Um, as we go through the presentation today, uh, we're going to be referring to the ALTA and SPS land title survey as just a simply a land title survey. Uh, the profession often refers to it as an ALTA or an ALTA, but that really isn't complete because the NSPS is such an integral part of developing the standards. The land title survey really comes about with any kind of a transfer of interest in real property. It could be because of a sale, uh, in the case of a, of a buyer who has a heightened level of due diligence, uh, or it could be placing a loan on the property. Uh, but in either of those cases, title insurance is a part of that transaction. Title insurance is, is primarily a risk avoidance tool. It involves uh, work done in advance of the issuance of the title policy, and it's intended to make sure that the lender is protected because the security they're relying on, the real property, uh, needs to have a good and marketable title. And if you're the buyer and you're the one initiating the, uh, the need for the ALTA survey, you want to make sure that you have good and marketable title. So next slide, please. Title insurance is different than most other types of insurance. Now, most of us are familiar with um, car insurance, fire insurance, health insurance, even life insurance. In, th in that type of insurance, the, the expectation is that there will be payouts, at least in, in the aggregate. And so the insurance companies look at their actuarials and their risk factors and history, and they come up with a premium based on the payouts that they expect to make, plus the reasonable profit. And title insurance is different because it, it, it is set up with the expectation that they never have a payout. Rather than events after the policy is issued triggering payouts, title insurance is based on the work that's done before the policy is issued. In other words, the, the title search that the title company undertakes before they issue the title insurance policy. What they do is, is they search uh, public records only, and then they identify any sort of risk factor that might create an adverse claim against the property. So that might be uh, uh, recorded uh, mortgages and liens, uh, property taxes, uh, easements, agreements, anything in the public record that can be tied back to that property is identified by the title company before they issue the policy. Then they create a schedule that lists all of the exceptions to their coverage. So their coverage is going to be uh, providing for good and marketable title except for those items that they've identified through their public record search. One important exception that all of these policies have is the survey exception. Uh, at the right side of the, of the slide is a typical one. The wording might be a little bit different, but basically they all say the same thing. They exclude any facts, rights, interests, or claims which are not shown in the public records, but which would be disclosed by an accurate survey and inspection of the land described therein, which is the land 
subject to the title insurance policy. Next slide, please. So when does the ALTA and SPS or land title survey, when does that come in? It comes into play when someone insists that the title company remove the survey exception. So it could be on occasion, a buyer who has a higher level of due diligence that wants the exception removed, or more often it's a requirement of the lender. They're making a loan on real property, the real property serves as their security, they don't want to suffer the potential for adverse claims against their interests based upon that survey exception that they don't know about. So uh, they basically insist that that survey exception be removed. Uh, the lender makes that a condition of the loan. The buyer, in his case, could be re requesting it because of higher due diligence. And sometimes it's a requirement of certain types of funding conditions like government backed funding of some types. So. Um, the exception, the survey exception being removed becomes the thing that triggers it. Next slide. So what's it look like? Um, there's a number of stakeholders in this process. There's the, the entity that wants the survey exception removed, usually a lender. There's the title company who is being asked to accept a, a higher level of risk. There's the client, the one paying the bill. And the way this all works is that someone indirectly initiates the requirement for the land title survey by insisting that the title company remove the survey exception. The client, the one paying the bill, requests the title company to remove the exception. The title company says, we can do that, but only if you get a land title survey. When they hear that, then the client contacts surveyors and asks for a quote or for a proposal. So back to the original question, who is the client exactly? Is it the title company? Uh, who is accepting the risk? Is it the buyer or the lender who demands that uh, the survey exception be removed or is it the one paying the bill? So obviously the, the client is the one paying the bill. They're really the client legally because they're the only ones that are contracted with the land surveyor to perform the land title survey. What's interesting is that um, the, the title company uh, frequently um, in fact, in my practice and, and consulting with others who've had the same experience, they're the ones really that would have the greatest risk and the greatest interest in the scope of work that's done as part of the land title survey. And yet, in my 40 some years of practice, I've never had the title company directly seek to engage in determining the scope of work. Uh, others that we've consulted with inside the company, other professional land surveyors report the same thing, which is interesting. Let's look at the type of clients that we have. So basically there's three typical clients. Um, the first type is, is pretty common. Uh, they're the ones who don't really understand the process very well. They don't know really what exactly you're doing with the land title survey. They're not familiar with the standards. Um, they just know that they need this because they want their loan recorded or they want their sale to close. So in essence, the client in this case is paying the bill to hire you to do something they don't really care anything about and they don't usually know or understand a whole lot about it. The next type of client is the one that has been through this process enough times, um, interacted with other surveyors, uh, has looked at a number of land title survey maps and understands what's going on. Um, they based on their experience, know what they're doing. And then the, the, the last group are the larger corporate clients, and they typically have their own standards, uh, internal land acquisition people or internal legal staff, or, or um, maybe it, it could be an outside uh, legal team. And those folks are formalizing the, the process based upon uh, their corporate policies. Um, they're really the the specialists. Next slide. So a few important reminders before we go on. Remember that in many cases, the client that's hiring you and paying the bill doesn't really care about the survey. They're just checking the box. They want to get their loan. They need the survey exception removed. The second and third types of clients are more knowledgeable and better prepared to discuss with you an appropriate scope of work for the land title survey, in particular, 
the optional items included with Table A of the land title survey standards. Um, just a point, it's, it's usually best to start with minimal Table A items unless they're specified in the request for proposal in a more of a formalized way. If they just come and ask you for an ALTA survey or an ALTA NSPS survey, um, it's best to start with the minimal items. And the reason for that is obvious. If you're, if the client is getting multiple proposals and you propose a cost based upon a more expanded scope of work, someone else may do just the, the minimum uh, the minimum survey standards, and you're obviously not going to have an opportunity to work on that project. So, uh, how do you how do you go forward? Clients with experience are obviously the easiest ones to work with. They they know what they want, they know what they need, and they're very willing to engage with you to talk about the table A items, the optional services, or any other work that you might do for them under item 20, which is essentially open ended. And uh, they understand the value that the land title survey can offer them besides just removing the survey exception. Um, in that case, the, the survey, the land title survey could be useful for marketing some or all of the property in the future. It could be useful for uh, some parts of early design effort. Uh, and it's all obviously valuable to the client in revealing to them certain aspects of the land that they might not otherwise have been aware of in terms of their future use of the property. Uh, corporate clients with their own internal staff or their own team, they're often the most difficult because while they're the specialists and they have control over the process, oftentimes they know what they want, but they don't have a detailed technical knowledge of the, the land survey standards or your duties as a professional land surveyor. Clients that rely on those specialist teams can be difficult sometimes because they may require you to do things that your contract doesn't require. For example, items in table A where they're required to provide the information to you, they may push you to do that work uh, even though you're not being compensated to do it. They may not approve of something that you've shown on the map, and they typically would insist on a review of the plat before it's submitted to the title company. They may ask you to remove things or show them differently because they object to what's being shown, and you may not be able to do that and still meet your duties as a professional surveyor. They may ask you to do certifications that are beyond what the standards provide, or even to alter the wording of a certification so that the, the work product that you submit to them uh, doesn't conform to the standards and isn't a valid land title survey map. So you have to use your negotiating skills, your diplomacy, and hopefully they'll engage with you and you can reach a compromise on what the map needs to show. The last group is the one we, we mentioned at the beginning on the previous slide. These are the ones who don't really know much about the process. Um, this provides the surveyor with a really great opportunity to engage with them, uh, to help inform and educate them about optional services included within table A, using that table as a kind of a tutorial. And even the, the standard work that's done for a land title survey, you've got an opportunity to advance and broaden the knowledge and understanding of the land surveying profession within a key part of your marketplace and to really promote the interests of the land surveyor. Uh, remember that when you're performing work like this, your responsibility goes beyond the person paying the bill. The title company is relying on your land title survey to take a risk by ensuring title against matters uh, that are disclosed by that survey. You're also putting the lender at risk if you make a mistake or leave something out. So the lender could be harmed, they're a stakeholder. Uh, the title company could be harmed, they're a stakeholder. And obviously the client, even members of the public who might rely on that work at a future date. So regardless of what the client who's paying the bill might require of you or demand of you, you're judgment and your professional performance as a land surveyor is, is something that you can't compromise beyond a certain point. 
we're licensed by the public, uh, we've got responsibilities to our employer, responsibilities to our client, and responsibility to the stakeholders and the general public. So keep that in mind as you negotiate the most appropriate Table A items to include in a land title survey based on the circumstances. Thank you for your time. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of the conference will be online to be available to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. That was a good discussion. Next, we're going to be talking about the field survey requirements. That presenter is Brandon Walker. Brandon is a professional land surveyor for the in the state of California. He has over 30 years experience, began surveying as a summer job in high school, and he's currently a senior surveyor for QK in the Bakersfield office. Thanks, Antonio. And thanks everyone for attending. The first item that I'll be discussing will be uh, the requirements for monuments. We need to locate the size, character, and the type on the land title survey. As you can see from this photo, the monument marking the equator in Ecuador, monuments can be quite large. I personally haven't seen any of this large, but I would love to perform a survey to, to locate something that, <laughs> size, that sizable. So sometimes boundaries can be established or marked by a waterway, a fence line, a rock, any other item that's been called out in a deed or a legal description. We've observed items such as axles, bottles, various types of metal rods, even a pickaxe used to, to mark boundary corners. So you never know what you're gonna find out there. So next, <clears throat> I have a list of items that need to be shown to depict rights away for the subject property. So the corners, corner or corners of the surveyed property to the nearest right of way line, name of any street, highway, or other public or private way abutting the surveyed property, visible evidence of physical access such as trails or walkways that's including vehicular pedestrian or, or any other forms of access these items are located to determine potential en encroachments it's very important to watch for evidence of access to and from water because that's, that's the most common place that you will find um, access issues and as you can see on the slide, I have a, a right-of-way monument in Vegas that delineates the Las Vegas Strip, which I thought was a pretty cool marker. So now we'll go on to the next slide, where I'll be discussing the lines of possession and improvements along the boundary. We must show the character and location of evidence of possession or occupation along the perimeter of the surveyed property, both the occupants of the surveyed property and by adjoiners. Unless physical access is restricted, the character and location of all walls, buildings, fences, and other improvements within five feet of each side of the boundary lines must be located and noted in the survey. Without expressing a legal opinion as to the ownership or, or nature of any potential encroachment. So we just list the issues and say that it's a potential encroachment. So the evidence location and extent of potentially encroaching structure, structural features and projections, such as fire escapes, bay windows, windows and doors that open outward, stoops, eaves, areaways, steps and trim to or onto adjoining property. So you know, it's things that are attached to a building or any improvement that may be extending over the property line. And this also includes you know, not just a property line, but rights away easements, setback lines that are located on the property that, that's being shown. The requirements for buildings is quite simple. All buildings must be located while conducting the field work. For, for a reference, I've attached a photo of our QK Clovis office. Easements and servitudes. So we must locate any evidence of easements, servitudes, or other uses other than the apparent occupants of the surveyed property, whether disclosed or not disclosed in the documents, if you observe anything basically crossing the surveyed property. These items would typically include roads, drives, sidewalks, paths. Also included would be utility service lines, utility location markings, 
including the source of the marking. But if you don't know the source, then you have to um, include a note of unknown. And also this would include water courses, ditches, drains, oil lines, utility lines, whether above ground or below. And then some of the other items included, which are just uh, more descriptive, would be manholes, valves, meters, transformers, pedestals, cleanouts, overhead lines, guy wires, and utility poles, all that are on or within 10 feet of the surveyed property. So, so the next uh, requirement is for cemeteries. Cemeteries need to be located as accurately as the evidence permits. The perimeter of, of cemeteries and burial grounds and the location of isolated grave sites not within a cemetery or burial ground. And these can be either disclosed in the documents provided or obtained in the field by the surveyor. So we have to be observant during the process of our field work. Um, this photo actually was taken on one of my vacations in Deadwood, and it's pretty evident here the, the inside a cemetery and it would be easily identifiable, but there's cases where, you know, just maybe a headstone or some rocks that could be potentially a burial site. And we would, we could list it that way as a potential burial site, burial ground or grave site, however large the site would be, however large the site is. So lastly, I'll be discussing the water features that need to be located as part of the survey. So the, the location of springs, ponds, lakes, rivers, canals, ditches, march, marshes, and swamps, all on, running through, or outside, but within five feet of the perimeter boundary of the surveyed property must be located. The location of any water feature forming a boundary of the surveyed property must be located as well. The, the attributes of the water feature located will include the items such as top of bank, edge of water, or high water mark. These items should be congruent with the boundary as described in the record description or in a case of an original survey, the new description. That concludes my portion of the pr presentation. And now I will turn it over to Antonio. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Brandon. That was a good discussion. Hello again, my name is Antonio. I'm a professional land surveyor in California as well as a certified federal surveyor. I've been with QK for about two and a half years now. My role at QK is the technical lead of land surveying. In this last segment of our presentation, I'm going to be discussing the accuracy requirement. The quick disclaimers that I will make is that this presentation only deals with the monuments that control the survey. Topographic features and measurements to other entities are not covered in the portion of the standards that I will be discussing. I'm going to make two key points in this presentation, which I will present as questions. The first is a least squares adjustment on your survey data required to meet the standard. And second, is the technology available to the land surveyor so good that the test of a least squares adjustment is all but meaningless because we have tested the equipment so many times that we know it always passes? Or to put the second question another way, is proper and diligent use of top tier equipment an appropriate substitution for the network adjustment? So let's get started. What is the measurement standard? Now, if we're talking about taking the national portion of the PLS exam, or at least for the version of the test I took, it's simple. 700s plus 50 parts per million. But in reality, it's more than a number. Sure, that's the value specified, but we have to understand the context. It's 700s plus 50 parts per million relative positional precision between points of connection as expressed by the results of a correctly weighted least squares adjustment of the survey. I have a direct quote here from the standards shown that starts to give us an answer to our first question of is a least squares adjustment required? If we continue on in the standards, we will find that it does specifically tell the surveyor that if the required RPP is ever exceeded on your survey, the surveyor is required to state that on the, on the map and not just a statement, but provide an explanation as to why the RPP was exceeded. Just looking at section 3.e.v, there may be some wiggle room here after we Google the definition of shall and find it telling us that the Supreme Court has ruled that the word shall means may, but 
And section six specifies all the items to be shown on the map and included is 6BX, where it explains that an explanation of RPP where it exceeds the specified value is required on the face of the map. So in conclusion of my first point, while there's no sentence that directly says the surveyor must run or release squares adjustment, when taking into context all of the sections of the standards relative to the accuracy requirement, a least squares adjustment must be run for the surveyor to appropriately sign the certificate saying he or she has met the standards. And by signing the certification of the land title survey, that's what you've said is that you meet the standards. The disclaimer that I will throw in here is that in less than a month, the standards will be updated. That language does modify the accuracy paragraph by one, limiting the test to only immediately adjacent boundary corners, and secondly, giving the user the direction that RPP can be estimated by the standard deviation of the distance between monuments, taking into account the full covariance matrix of the coordinate inverse. My comment on this is that the modification does not give the user the ability to simply compute expected values based on any instrument specifications. A survey must still be made consisting of redundant measurements to produce standard deviations of any values contributing to a survey. 3.e.v is modified slightly in the update, but the language on my slide accommodates that. And 6bx is unchanged. So again, taking into consideration the entirety of the specifications, I think it's appropriate to conclude a least squares adjustment is needed. As I transition into point number two, is the technology that good? I would like to point out that my discussion centers around the concept that we are always using GPS. I know that is not entirely true profession-wide. For those total station only folks out there, the idea that redundancy is required to achieve proper statistical analysis still applies. A least squares adjustment is a math model that is not exclusive to GPS. It can be used to adjust total station and leveling data just the same. In this next slide, I'm going to show you the common methods of applying GPS technologies in an efficient manner. This comes from my conversation slash network experiences, not necessarily anything out of a book. As you read through it, I will discuss GPS vectors with respect to the least squares adjustment. So when we perform an RTK survey, whether it be a base rover system or a network RTK system, the idea is that the base or virtual base or reference stations is on a, is on a point with known values and every point surveyed is unknown. A least squares adjustment that has more observations than unknowns yields a most probable solution, which is appropriate. A least squares adjustment that has a number of observations equal to unknowns yields a unique solution. This is not an appropriate solution for proper statistical analysis. An unmeasured monument or control point has three unknowns, X, Y, and Z. And one GPS vector has three measurements, delta X, delta Y, and delta Z. So therefore, a single GPS vector from a reference station yields a unique solution. Redundancy comes from measuring that unknown point from multiple known locations or multiple measurements from one known location. In this next slide, we can discuss how to use each of the listed practical field methods to produce a network that will yield a proper statistical analysis. Just kidding, you can't. So again, to go over the slide a couple couple slides previous, those were all situations where we have one known location and we're surveying it once, surveying those control points or those monuments one times. Maybe we're doing it twice, but we're doing it within, within a very short amount of time. So a single vector from an RTK survey is inadequate for the professional surveyor to evaluate boundary or control data. Stacking multiple vectors on top of each other in order to get redundancy with, within too short of a time frame is just faking the math. 
one must either observe a long enough time lapse between measurements to allow a different satellite constellation to form. For instance, I've seen specs that suggest a minimum 45-minute sidereal time lapse. When I only have one base and one rover available to me, that's what I use on my surveys. Or you can make the multiple make the multiple observations from different reference stations. This can be accomplished by setting up two bases and collecting an observation from each base, which is my preferred method if I have all of the necessary equipment. So I'm totally open to being proved wrong here. I'll be the first to admit that spending 30 to 60 seconds measuring a monument one time is going to be a lot more efficient than any other method. And until any standards are updated to be based on the RMS of a baseline itself, I don't think that that's going to be an option. At this point, we have had a lot of discussion, and I hope that you can tell where I'm going with the answer to our second question, which was, is the technology available to the land surveyor so good that the test of, of a least scores adjustment is all but meaningless because we have tested the equipment so many times that we know it always passes? My position is clearly no. And in the last side, I will offer a real world piece of evidence to that end. So this is a screenshot of a network from one of my previous jobs. I was running two base stations, each on a control point with published values, spaced a half mile apart. Those two points fit each other within two hundredths of the published values. So the problem is not what was not with the base stations or the values from them. Each monument was measured once from each base station. Now I have a, you can't see it on the screen, but I have a full 180 epics on each from in each measurement. So there's true redundancy of measurements going on here. And what I'm pointing out is on the right side of the screen, which is the ALTA NSPS land title survey accuracy test that is built right into TBC as it is with other processing software. The red font signifies there is a point of connection that fails the test. So one of my points, number 114, fails its connection with 115, 116, 120, and 121. There's four points of connection that fail in this survey. With reference to the current standards, there's four points of connection that are failed. And now with reference to the updated standards coming next month, points 121 and 116 are immediately adjacent to 114. So there's still two points of connections that fail there. So before or after February 23rd, 2021, what I'm saying is that it is entirely possible to perform a normal boundary survey and not meet the land title survey accuracy standards. So to conclude this segment, one must still run a least course adjustment and the technology is just not that good. Thank you for listening.